this is who I am, you know, out on the land. This is this is my Inuit way of living with the smoke fish and and the, you know the birds and the hunting and the trapping and stuff. This is who who I am, you know. They don't understand. They got to stop and think. I mean, God put them fish in the water for the people. Fried salmon, boiled salmon, and uh, you make fish steak. Delicious. Everything, everything, the eyeballs, the nostrils, the, the muscles in the cheek, uh, the little gristle in the, in the, in the top, of, top of their nose, skin. I, I, you know, I, I make sure I eat the skin of all fish. You want Omega? Here's Omega. Midsummer on the northern Labrador coast. Atlantic salmon are returning from their winter at sea to the coastal areas of Nunatsiavut. By late summer, they will head to the rivers and make their way upstream where they will spawn. Meanwhile, their close relative, Arctic char, have been feeding inshore for many weeks. They will soon begin to move toward the heads of the bays in preparation for their journey upstream to inland waters. Unlike salmon, Arctic char will overwinter in the frozen ponds of the interior, returning to the bays the following spring. For thousands of years, Atlantic salmon and Arctic char have persisted along this coast. As anadromous fish, they migrate from freshwater to the sea and then return to freshwater in order to spawn. Along the way, they adapt to vastly different ecosystems and somehow manage to navigate to their home river. During this same time, the Aboriginal people have acquired a wealth of knowledge about the natural rhythms associated with the availability of their fishery resources. They have developed skills for how best to harvest and preserve salmon and char, modifying their gear and techniques as they adapted to changes. Over centuries, they have created rich social, cultural, and spiritual traditions, which they continue to pass to the next generation. For the people of Nunatsiavut today, Atlantic salmon and Arctic char remain at the center of their culture and heritage, helping to define who they are and how they relate to their natural world. Atlantic salmon live in the North Atlantic Ocean, with their North American range extending from Ungava Bay south to the mouth of the Connecticut River. Atlantic salmon from Labrador undertake extensive migrations to their overwintering areas in the Labrador Sea, with some traveling as far as West Greenland. Not all salmon return each year to Labrador rivers. Those that travel to West Greenland spend multiple winters at sea. Some of these salmon may return to Labrador from a northern route, arriving on the north coast during the fall. For the Labrador Inuit, the annual arrival of Atlantic salmon is one of the most carefully observed and eagerly awaited natural events. Biggest fish ever in John Fleet. <laughs> <laughs> when the salmon would come, it's going to depend on the type of uh, a season it is, of course. Uh, a year when there isn't any ice on the coast, uh, ice coming from the north, running up the Labrador coast, the, the salmon will come in probably in late June. If it's a Summer with a lot of ice running along the coast, then we might not get any salmon until sometime in July. Salmon, from what I understand, don't run under the ice. 
the run of salmon usually started around the 7th of Ju July the 1st. Uh, that's when the first good sign of salmon started to come around. The first lot of salmon usually are the larger ones. And we've seen a pattern where large salmon come first and usually in August and late July you see the uh, increase in smaller salmon. But over the last couple of years we've seen that some people will get uh, smaller salmon with the large salmon. So there seems to be a combination of fish arriving at the same time. The pattern has changed a little now we get uh, salmon. Uh, the young ones come a little earlier with, with the older ones. Yeah, there's a bit change in the salmon too, because uh, there's a lot of peels, we call them peels, they're small salmon. But scattered ones, we get maybe close to 18, 19 pounds, just very scarce. But don't get very many whole big salmon, mostly all like five, six pounds, something like that. First, when they start coming, it gets about like 14, 15 pounders, but it's not very often. Carrot breeds usually start and say they let the Riglet people know, and then up in Northwest, the people that do, the people in Riglet, or they say that the salmon, somebody got so many salmon, they maybe say, okay, within a week, they're going to hit up in our area, up in Lake Mel. And it's always, it's always happened. That's the way they come. The migrate, see? And then some more times we just see a lot of stouts around, a certain color stout, and the people will say, well, that's a salmon stout. So the salmon is getting close. Arctic char have a circumpolar range and are the most northerly of all anadromous and freshwater fishes. They spend less time at sea than salmon and do not make extensive journeys. Char begin their seaward migration during the spring runoff and ice breakup in the rivers. Along the coast north of Nain, they may journey outside the bays in search of prey. Char lives in, uh, in ponds and in, uh, in rivers wintertime. And then they come out with spring breakup and then they spend the summer feeding, probably about three weeks or a month. They come all around the head of the bays uh, all around, uh, you know, the, the coastline. In the July and August, just when they start going in to the brooks and that, hanging around in the brooks, and sometimes in the middle of the August or somewhere around 20th, and they go in the brook, and this time we finish fishing, then when they go in the brook. When we were fishing, the, the capelin was here, and. Uh, the char would stay in the bay all year, all summer, but now there's nothing to eat, and uh, as soon as the ice goes out, now the char disappears over the summer. They go on out wherever they're trying to get food, and in August they come come back in. So most of the summer they're, they're not around. The Labrador Inuit have accessed the local salmon and char populations by moving seasonally to coastal areas where the fish could be intercepted during the peak runs. This was especially important for families that took part in the commercial salmon and char fishery. From Upper Lake Melville, they traveled to fishing stations near Rigolet. From Makovic and Postville, Hopedale and Nain, they traveled to outside islands. Sometimes the journey lasted several days. The day school was out, actually everybody's motorboats was full of the dogs and the kids and the dishes and the mattresses and we'd come over here to live for the summer. And we, we ate porcupine, we ate some ducks and we'd eat uh, not very many salmon because our salmon were to sell. So we'd have, you know, like you'd sell the big salmon whole and the small salmon, you'd take the heads off of them, and we used to eat the heads, and we'd eat the liver, and we'd eat the puttocks, uh, the stomachs of the salmon. We'd clean them out and eat them. We used to leave Mulligan 1st of June and uh, row out to Riglet, which is about uh, 60 miles away, in a small rowboat there. Eh? All small children and dogs, dogs running along shore. And uh, 
it's a, sometimes it's a take six and eight days. You had a real good time, no wind, you could do it in three, three days. With any wind blow at all, anything about 10 or 15 kilometer wind, you had to run ashore, because we, we loaded so much. Got everything we wanted was in our boat. So our family was uh, five, but some people had eight and six and eight and ten children, eh? Sometimes there'd be five boats of us rowing down together, but we'd leave it three or four days ahead of one another. Better for getting food going along, eh? Like for getting ducks and that. You had to get everyone food going along. There was no nothing. We had nothing to eat on you. Bread and butter. We didn't. Families moved north uh, between uh, eighty and a hundred miles, and you know there were some twenty-three, twenty-four families that moved down there, and we had a you know a little fifty-foot collector boat, and usually around the first part of July, we would take the the first families down. Some would go by themselves, and they all had their little fishing spots around Ocock Bay, uh, Mugford's area. This is all between 80 and 100 miles north of Maine. And they would start fishing char first, and then they would move off to the islands and fish salmon. We did that all summer. We'd just go back and forth, bring a fish back to the fish plant, and food and supplies and passengers back down to the little fishing spots. For the residents of Nain, the fishing season when they lived at camps was a particularly important time for the whole family. And the salmon was really good around Cutthroat area, north of the Kilpikes there. You know, some people get 90, 100 salmon haul in the morning. There's uh, about 70, 80 miles from here, I guess, north of there. There were a lot of people fishing there, houses there, and most, most of them lived in the Labrador tents, so most of the family. They stayed there till school started. And some of them would come back when the fishing got too bad. We uh, always went back to uh, Okok Bay uh, because father was a fisherman and uh, that lifestyle was, uh, was uh, very good uh, for the family. Uh, father took uh, everyone up to Okok Bay in motorboat and, and that helped us to, uh, to live uh, as a family uh, throughout the summer. When people fished for salmon and char, north of Nain or out on the lakes or in the bays around Nain or anywhere else, family was together. And uh, the young people, you know, stayed out of trouble. And uh, they, they learned to do things. Uh, they, they felt uh, useful. Uh, they felt that uh, they, they were worth something and, and their self-esteem uh, was much better. They were healthier mentally, physically, uh, emotionally, and spiritually. And I, I believe uh, that uh, we, we need to get something like that back. Learn the cultural uh, Inuit way uh, that, that was used to uh, l live off the land, uh, to know who you are, and to know where you come from. And I believe uh, even that uh, can change a person, especially if uh, our children and our young children can go back uh, to be shown where their grandparents and their parents uh, used to fish, uh, used to live after fish, uh, the caribou, the seal, the birds. The Labrador Inuit built a knowledge base about where and when the fish move and how to adapt their techniques to patterns of natural occurrences involving ice, tide, and wind. They combined this local knowledge with adjustments to the gear and mesh sizes over time. Through these adaptive measures, the stocks are managed for conservation and so that beneficiaries can access the resource. We set a net in a particular place for a time where you know that there's some, quite a bit of uh, bait, what we call lanch and tapelin, uh, gathers. And it's usually a good place for salmon. And also, uh, if you put your net in a, in a cove, uh, you have less problem with uh, keeping it clean. Because if you have it in a tidy place, the tide is on the net and let more strain on your net, not fishing as well, 
And if there's any callop running, uh, usually your net is usually floats it on the water and fills up with kelp. So if you put your net into a, a smaller culvert, it's less tied and not as much strain on it, then the net uh, hangs properly and fishes better. Uh, when you put an, a net on an angle in the cove, uh, it, it fishes better because when the tide falls, the net can hold its same position, uh, facing toward from the shallow water to the deeper water areas. And it seems to fish a lot better, and uh, that, ha that plays a role. And, uh, and the lie of the land, too, certainly, okay? Say if we were here and um, we're expecting the salmon to come from this way, we'd, it, we'd change our angle probably to 60, 70 degrees, eh? Depends on the tide and that, too. Uh, if you watch the iceberg, when it would come to the land, right where you put your net, that's where the iceberg would go. That's a good bird because the, I think the flow of water would bring the, bring the fish right there every time, practically. You know, if you see an iceberg and watch it coming and see where it goes, it'll, and we would always say too, look at iceberg, look at icebergs, and they're gonna go right to our net. And that's good birds, I think, personally. Individuals established berths in areas that were known to be good places to fish. The right to fish at a particular berth has been passed down through generations and is maintained through an informal network of respect. People identify each berth by name. Okay, this here is called a grassy cove. Uh, that place is almost uh, 90 years old now, that building. Uh, my uncle Henry Pottle, uh, his father used to fish here before him. And uh, now I, I, uh, I fish just up above there. They sat in it there on Sunday, called it Sunday Rock. There was another one porpoise point. We had a porpoise in that net one time. Up above that, there was a place called Fish Point, full of codfish in that net. So we would just put the names on as, there's a little bend. We would refer to that as in the bend. Every bird had its own name, right? The Labrador Inuit have always depended on salmon and char for food. Now, through the Nunatsiavut government, a communal fishery for food, social, and ceremonial purposes has been established and is managed with community-specific conditions regarding dates, net length, and mesh size, which can vary from year to year. Beneficiaries are entitled to one communal salmon license for their household. In 2010, the household limit was seven salmon. There was no limit on char. Big female gets get to spawn, isn't it? Charlotte and David Wolfrey have been drying salmon at their cabin near Rigolette. They are getting ready to smoke them in the traditional way. We get this all stump up here, la. They gather moist, rotten wood and sods from the plant known locally as blackberry. That's good, the gr ground is good, Dave, because that'll smother the... That's good, now we should go over and try to start the fire. Yes, he's going to go. I told you one match, the Labrador girl. The fire produces much smoke without being too hot, while the blackberry sweetens the flavor. Smokehouse all good, up. fire perfect. Smoked salmon after, I guess, a riglet salmon, I guess. Some people would uh, make Pepsi or like set up in slices and dry it, and other people would smoke it, and um, some people would salt it. So 
So you could have stewed fish or fried salmon or um, boiled salmon, and uh, or you could have dried fish, you know. So there was a, a combination of ways of preparing the food. Uh, basically, um, smoked, dried, and uh, salted. That was the way that we lived in, like there were no freezers or anything like that. So salt was the main way of preparing the food, like preserving the food and uh, drying it or smoking it. So uh, you had to eat it fresh or prepare it. And then you were hungry. Why not? Come on, you're just menacing. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, eat, dig it. Usually, nearly every part of the salmon is consumed. Sharing a meal is an important tradition. In the coastal communities to the north, especially Hopedale and Nain, Arctic char is consumed in greater numbers than Atlantic salmon. To fish for char, people still practice the traditional net fishery, while increasingly they fish for char with a rod. Char is more important here than, than any other species of fish, I, I think. Uh, it's the most sought after fish here, uh, it's most widely used. Uh, uh, I'd say every home in town uses char, like every home in perhaps Riglet uses salmon for, for their primary food species. Studies by Nunatsiavut and university researchers have established that more char is harvested in the region of Nain than in any other community. Nain residents access char year-round. During the winter, they fish through the ice on freshwater ponds. It's easier to get around now. You got the skidoo. Because before they, they couldn't. Before the skidoo, they had the dog teams, and they, they couldn't really get around to the bays. But so they got, they got the char in the summer, salted and that. And with the skidoos, you can, where they took a day to go in the, with the dog team, they take about an hour now, so they can go fish whenever they want with the skidoo. For the older generation of today, Atlantic salmon and Arctic char remain at the center of their culture and heritage. They hope that the younger generation will appreciate how the fundamental values of the Inuit culture also apply to the use of salmon and char. Those values center on respect, sharing, and not allowing any waste. Using all of the uh, of the animal, using the whole the whole thing, uh, I think that 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 connects people uh, with the animal itself. How you got to bang me my kung ali? So do nekat sa sin ni, at si kito na ka sa nung ni, at si kito na to mi inum ni. How you got to bang me lang? Nobody would keep their first salmon for themselves. They'd cut it up and share it out amongst their family or the people that they know are going to preach, the elders or the people they know that are going to appreciate it. The people of Nunatsiavut believe in keeping healthy the Labrador populations of Atlantic salmon and Arctic char. The responsibility is theirs to manage wisely so that the people may benefit and the migrations of these magnificent fish may continue. Yeah.
if you look at oceans and fish, I mean, they've been around oceans for about a million years, and the fish been fish too, and they've done pretty well. But 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 but, and to say we got to manage them, to me, even even as a fish house, it's a bit ridiculous. I think it's people who have to manage themselves. That's that's what I really believe. That's what I really believe. Because they've done pretty good on their own until we came along. But I I think for the long term. Um, for that renewable resource char, which is important to everyone, is going to be taken care of by us. We're into our own, taking care of our own things now, self-government and all that. So it's really important for for us to take care of our wildlife and the beautiful land we live in, and we are supposed to take care of it. We have a responsibility. Please be of conservation-minded person. Uh, you know, always respect what the elders have said and is saying. And you know, as, as long as I'm living, I will pass that message on to them. And you know, I, I'm, I'm just hoping some of those young people can hear me and I can make a difference in one life for the sake of our resource. You know, learn as much as you can from the older people in the community because the knowledge there is unsurpassed and there's a wealth of knowledge and more so than any book.